Hey guys, welcome back to the plant room. It feels like so long since I filmed in here and realistically it's been like two and a half weeks maybe, but it feels like ages. Ever since I came back from Miami, that was like a week, almost two weeks ago, I've just been in hardcore work mode. Like it was straight back to work the next day and I've been working so hard on those vlogs. You guys, it was such a labor of love and um, I think I put so many hours into it. I haven't like worked that hard on a video for a really long time and I just submitted the last one for approval since it was a sponsored video so now it's kind of like business as usual and now I can kind of focus on my plants again and there's just so much to do. I cannot believe the plant chores that have kind of accumulated over the last two weeks. Lots of new growth, um, development on berries. There's plants that desperately need repotting that I knew that was gonna happen before I left but I didn't have time to do it so I'm like minorly stressed right now and also like the at the top of my mind right now is like how am I gonna make more space because the bin is back <laughs> the freaking bin is back this is a bin of plants I brought back from IAS and then I just got off FaceTime with Charmaine and there's a whole huge box of plants that she's bringing back for me I was looking at her on FaceTime and I was just like where are we gonna put these all like these beautiful beautiful babies I don't know where they're gonna go I simply don't know. So we're gonna have to do some hardcore purging. Today though, I have a, a rough plan. I want, first of all, to kind of go over how I brought plants back from Miami because I got some questions on this, like how do you fly with plants? What's the process for getting them from the US to Canada? I saw this question quite a bit on um, Facebook, especially surrounding IAS, people were like, how do you fly with them? Like what, what happens at the airport? Like what are the rules? And I'm not an expert, but I, pretty sure I followed the rules so I'll go through my process and like how I pack the plants they're doing pretty well um th there's very minor damage on them and I also want to get these all repotted into my substrate and get them kind of situated I don't know if they're gonna be able to move anywhere else other than the bin they might have to stay in the bin for a little while but I just wanted to repot some of them like maybe a few of them actually need repots but I just figured I'll do them all so it's a little bit of show and tell, a little bit of repot, and I want to catch you guys up on like my thoughts on IAS, um, like my my experience, kind of like after the fact, after you know what I physically say while I'm filming, what you would have seen in the vlogs, my takeaways from the members dinner when we listened to the panel with um, what was it? it was Bill, Enid, um, Marie. Paul, Rory, um, I took a few notes and I thought we can just have a little catch up, catch up session. Oh, also I want to catch you guys up on the pest treatments because it has gone better than maybe I had even hoped for. You know, I'm gonna have to grab my, should I grab my camera? I was, I was gonna film it on my phone, but I literally have the Woohoo Live <laughs> right here playing. I guess I can exit out of the live. Okay, maybe I'll just film it on my phone. So how is this video gonna go? Okay, let's go through pest management. Then I'll go through some notable growth updates. Then we'll get um, repotting the new plants and we'll do the IS recap then. Okay, that's how we're gonna do it. So the pest treatment, I was so delighted to come home and see all these new leaves growing out in ambient that didn't have any pest damage whatsoever. So I'm gonna recap you a bit on like what I did for pest treatment. The pests in question, were thrips and spider mites. And the thrips happened a couple of months ago, maybe like a month and a half ago, and the spider mites has just been my whole identity for the past two years. So it was like here, the exos, and here. Thank God they weren't in the tent, but I did, um, first of all, for thrips, I did spinosad. I have also been using the spinosad for spider mites, but I'm just like not 100% clear on how effective it is. Hold on, I need some coffee. <laughs> I need to hydrate before I talk about this. So this is the spinosad that I've been using. So I mix like a couple of drops in this into a spray bottle and I just spray everything. So um, unsure if that really did much for spider mites. Maybe it did a little bit, but it didn't completely eradicate them. I should also mention that what I thought was spider mites for the longest time was probably a mixture of spider mites and flat mites or broad mites, one of the two. I don't have a microscope. I don't even know if they're different or if like flat mites is a type of broad mite, I, I simply don't know. So anyways, the thrips got this in the form of foliar spray and I also did a soil drench on every plant. So I did go through and water like the same concentration into every pot of every plant here. And then um, I did foliar sprays multiple times. I also used Dr. Doom's um, Thrip Killer Spray at least once on not every plant, but on a few plants that I visibly saw the thrips on. 
I can't say that like that was what did it. I, it has worked for me in the past, but I do think that the spinner set did the heavy lifting because I used it the most across all of the plants. And to recap, um, this is what the thrips damage looked like. So there is definitely thrips damage on this leaf and this was during the little thrips outbreak, but you can see that concentration of silvery squiggles right there. Um, there's also like mite damage on here in like the speckles, but that's what the thrips damage looked like on my anthurium. I was actually like really scared that the, the pest treatments might do something bad to the berries that were forming on this, but they seem to be, they seem to be trucking along just fine. To be fair, I don't think it was like the most massive thrips outbreak. I never once saw an adult thrip. They were all little like squiggly white larvae. I don't know how they even got in here. So I'm gonna continue going in with spinosad spray and spray everything down. I might do one more soil drench, especially on this shelf right here that I feel like maybe there might be remnants of little bugs every now and then, but I certainly didn't see anything back here. In, in terms of thrips damage. Up here, my exos was all mite damage and then the odd thrips damage down here. So maybe one more soil drench up here and I think we might be good. The most gratifying thing though when I came back was seeing new leaves without mite damage. I've just been dealing with like little speckles on my leaves um, it, for the plants out here for for as long as I can remember. And the thing I did differently this time was I sprayed daily. So I think like the consistency of my pest treatment was really what was messing me up. So I ended up going back to like a tried and true basic favorite, which is Safer's End All. So this is a perethrin based spray. And uh, you know, in Canada, you might not know this, but in Canada, pesticides are pretty heavily regulated. So systemic pesticides are mostly banned in Canada. And like, if you can get it, it's usually because you have some sort of horticultural license to do so. So this is a lot easier to get. You can get it at the hardware store. And the thing I liked best about this is that the spray is like really wide and really, it's like a slow spray. Do you know what I mean? So it's not like, psh, psh, it's like, and it covers a wide surface. It's pretty fine. It's really even. So it almost felt like no effort at all. Once the lights went off, I would come in here in the evening and then just spray every single leaf that is out in ambient. I didn't spray my exos because I put um, predatory mites in there. So I was using this one. This is from Copper and I believe they're just in Canada, but these are Spickle Ultimites. So these are the Californicus mites that they do battle um, spider mites. I wasn't sure if they would go after flat mites. I wouldn't be surprised if they ate flat mites, but I think there's just like not a lot of information on flat mites and broad mites. Like when I look at, um, pest prevention when I try to google it there's just way less information than spider mites so it's very possible that the California kids do go after flat mites but I bought them for the spider mites and I put them in the exo so I didn't spray in there I didn't want to kill the beneficiary I I always say beneficiary mites beneficial mites I didn't want to kill them with any sprays so I just I just let the predatory mites do their thing so in summary the daily sprays with safer's end all was so good if it was like spinosad spray every single day I don't know if it would have worked as well because just the spray bottle I have is more like there's not really like a surfactant in there that like lets it like cling to the leaf a little bit more. And you can make a really fine spray that doesn't build up and start dripping all over the floor. I guess you can overdo it, but it was pretty easy for me to keep it nice and tidy. So yeah, I'm gonna just show you some of the new leaves that have come in since I did the, the daily spraying. So I will say that I did the daily spraying for about two weeks straight up until Miami and I haven't done any pest, pest management stuff since Miami. So this is my Novelty G Ace. This one used to live in my tent and I moved it out and the first leaves that grew here immediately started getting these little speckles. Here's the next leaf after that. That is covered in these little speckles as well and I'm pretty sure these are flat mite damage. But the leaf that came out after I came back from Miami is speckle free from the looks of it, which is amazing to see. Here's a, a massive leaf. Sorry, we're right by the grow light, but this is a Crystal Lux. This to me does not look like pest damage. This looks like more mechanical damage. And I find that um, pest damage, or maybe they don't like Lux or Lux hybrids as much, but I rarely see mite damage on my Lux and Lux hybrids. But I also wanted to show you that leaf because it's getting freaking humongous. This HU Red Crystal leaf is also looking pretty good and speckle free. This is a new Pally leaf that I cannot see any damage on. It's getting really long. 
I'm really concerned about this because look, it's almost touching the floor and it's still got quite a lot of growing to do. And then in the EXO, the Minahasa, the leaf before, you can see on this leaf there is mite damage, there's also thrips damage right there. But the new leaf that has pushed out since then, I don't see any damage whatsoever. In here is where I definitely saw spider mites. So I think these are dead predatory mites. They're definitely not spider mites, but I think they've kind of like run out of food. So they're starting to die off on these leaves, unfortunately. So the damage here is like, it's kind of looking dusty. I've wiped it a whole bunch of times. That's permanent, but I think the spider mites are gone from it. My Wenlingeri, this is my Woohoo Wenlingeri. Oh my gosh. Okay, so this plant needs a new spot because it's like, it can't, I can't get it to stay upright. I do have to tilt it like that, but it put out a new leaf and it is getting so big. It definitely needs a heavier pot and to move out of here, but look how roughly dimply it's getting. And this new leaf is just about to harden off. It's not fully, fully done yet, but I think it's about done growing. So this one's not so much of a victory for me because I find that mites don't seem to go for when lingerie so much. It's very rare that I see pest damage on them. Here's another leaf that grew in here. Um, seems to be damage free as well. This one is like a lost tag so we'll have to figure out what it was but i think it's maybe a crystal mag or mag crystal anyway that's just been like a great thing to come back to to my collection because like the mite damage has just been driving me up the wall for like two years and it really was only once i started to like think that they were flat mites and maybe switching up because i think this will kill flat mites but i don't know that spinosad goes for flat mites. Again, I tried to look for it on Google. I couldn't find definitive information, not saying that it's not out there, but I couldn't find it. Um, whenever I search for spinosad and flat mites, it always goes back to spider mites. And I was just trying to find out, does spinosad kill flat mites? And I don't know that it does, but since I've been treating with spinosad for so long and I've been getting unrelenting mite damage, but once I started switching to this and being consistent with this, that I know kills flat mites and the speckles are starting to go away. I feel like maybe spinosad doesn't. I mean, that's anecdotal, but just in my experience, the spinosad didn't really do anything for the flat mites or what I believe to be flat mites. Anyways, none of this is like hard definitive information. This is my experience of what I've been trying to do to get rid of the speckles. And to me, changing my mindset that maybe they're flat mites and not spider mites was a bit of a game changer. I also want to try something else. Um, so I saw on Facebook, someone was recommending something called a sticker spreader, spreader sticker, <laughs> something like that. It's basically a surfactant that you add to pesticides to make it like spread and stick to leaves. Um, so it doesn't just like bead and run off like water. So Charmaine found a bottle of it in the States it's way cheaper down there and she's gonna try it out. Maybe I can get like a tablespoon from her and try that out. I'm not sure if it will perform any different than just simply adding a few drops of dish soap to your homemade pest sprays. Maybe it's the fact that it doesn't leave a residue like dish soap might. I literally haven't used it, so I'm excited to try it. Maybe if she'll share it with me. So yeah, that's my pest update. And I wanna show you some fun growth updates because I was going to leave this for like a dedicated growth updates video. I just don't know when that's gonna be because believe it or not, I'm already planning for Christmas. I'm gonna be going away, so I won't need to make sure that everything is planned and like I get a little bit ahead of schedule before I leave for three weeks. So yeah, because I don't know if a growth updates video is in the works, it might be before um, holidays, I am going to show you a few things. The first thing is a plant that I, I got so excited to come home to because I saw it at IAS and it was so beautiful and I was just like even more motivated to start to get my act together and try to get this plant darker and growing nicer. It's growing nicely, don't get me wrong, but the color's not quite there yet. And that is my Midnight Velvet from Owen. It popped this leaf before I went away, but it's been expanding and hardening off since then. And um, to preface this plant, I've been having trouble getting nice and dark leaves because I know it can be super, super dark. You know what? It is looking better than before I left. So maybe it's harder to show you now. It doesn't really mean as much on the old, old leaves, but this is the leaf before. And for so many months, I was having trouble like 
with the leaves looking chlorotic so they would have like a lot of like lightning in between the veins it has actually gotten so much better on the newest leaf it got really scuffed up because it kept rubbing up on other plants but the color is looking really nice and it's not looking chlorotic like if you just ignore all the little scratches and scuffs you don't see lightning in between the veins so how i've been growing this plant um, is on owen's advice he says that it really doesn't like drying out so he likes to leave it a little bit wetter than other anthurium so i try to leave i don't know if you can see the reservoir is kind of dried up but there's a little bit of water in here i let it sit in a little bit of water sometimes it's okay if that reservoir runs out but i never ever let it get even like closely approaching dry the other thing i was trying to do is not give it too much light so i was keeping it down here at the front of my tent it's facing the tent wall instead of like be facing a grow light and despite not getting direct light from my grow light it was still getting a little bit bleachy looking so I kind of somewhat deduced that maybe it was a feed thing so I'm very consistent with TPS1 I feed with every watering but I'm not so consistent with CalMeg so I watered this with CalMeg a couple of times in the last month and it seems to have been working like I was seeing that this leaf was getting darker and I was like okay maybe it is the magnesium that it was lacking and then this leaf is not getting the chlorosis like it would um, definitely be showing by now if it was the other leaves. Owen has also suggested that maybe it's a temperature thing. Um, I got this from him like March, April, something around there and it wasn't really hot then. It didn't really get hot in Vancouver until like maybe late June, early July. And I remember having the light color leaf problem like long before it started getting really hot for the summer. So I'm going to lean towards feed and making sure that I give, give this thing CalMeg. I mean CalMeg is important but I feel like some anthurium just show it more than others. And I think the Midnight Bell is just one of those ones that show the CalMag deficiencies more. But now that it's getting a little bit more mature, I feel like the hot pink reddish sinus is getting a little bit more prominent. It's still showing on the prior leaf and it's kind of like wavy and the leaves kind of like twist a little bit. It's just so pretty. So I was like seeing this at IAS at Hoffmanny High's booth and I was like, man, how lucky am I to have this plant? The fact that Owen shared this piece of his collection with me is just like, I'm so eternally grateful. Okay, another plant that just blew my mind when I got back was my X1 cross with X1. I don't think there's any way to show you this plant without showing you the big <laughs> new leaf because I came back, I was like, what the heck is this monster in my tent? Look, look at that new leaf. It's freaking humongous this one was so pretty and like so slender why is it getting blown out it was like really long and skinny tall bunny ears and then i went away and then <laughs> this this ginormous thing and look at the back it's so purpley um this was the plant that i had boat molded so i got it as a stump from jing it was no it wasn't a stump it was a one leaf or something like that it's been non-stop growing it was a like stump cutting though and then it was in like a little kind of cup so i boat motored this and it looks so stupid because it was like this big when i put this in this giant pot and i was like i don't really want to repot it very often and it has rapidly filled out this pot and now we're here and now it needs a repot again but wow this leaf it's not even done hardening yet and now I don't have space for it in my tent. Well, I barely have space for it in my tent. It's getting to the point where if it puts out one more leaf, it's gonna start squashing itself. Other plants are gonna squash it and it's very full of roots. Um, so this is kind of stuff where I'm like, there's so many plant chores to do and I don't have that much time. But I figured like, since we're doing some of them today, if I do them bit by bit, it's not so daunting. Like it's not like one massive, session of plant chores i need to do i just need to be consistent about chipping away at these plant chores like bit by bit but yeah this was definitely a surprise when i came home from miami i didn't even know i had a new leaf out another unexpected leaf size jump this one actually stresses me out because i'm like i don't know if i have space for you in the tent anymore my red crystallinum let me show you the previous leaf first this is her this is the nsc red crystallinum from amanda or bunny so it had popped a new leaf while i was away I've been watching it really closely and I've been like um, photographing it because when it first comes out it's like purple vein like a really rich barney purple and then it starts to get pinker and pinker over time but it freaking got huge and it's just looming in the corner of my tent it lives like right here on the edge and I don't know if it's going to be able to fit in there anymore like this leaf is still really squishy and soft let me give you a close-up of the veins it's so 
I just smacked the saucer and just splooched a puddle of water. One second. <laughs> this plant room also needs another deep clean. Like I need to vacuum and mop the floors. But this plant has just come so far since my days of struggling with it where it couldn't form leaves. And I really think that we're out of the woods now. And while I would love to cut and share this plant, I don't think it's gonna respond well to it. So I'm going to leave it because also it has finally started flowering. <laughs> There's a flower coming out of this petiole right here, if you can see. This one actually is quite round. It's just really hard to see because it does this like cupping back thing. If you can see, it cups back. It's really cute. Like it gives a nice like rounded Japanese pancake kind of appearance, but you can't really see the width of it unless I flatten it out a bit. It's so pretty. And I really want to hoard more red chrysalinum. Like I would love um, a really nice purpley like Michelle or something. But you know what? Like this thing is just, that's exactly what I wanted from a red chrysalinum. So why look further? Like it has, pick it up again. It has that pebbly, pebbly texture. It has the pink veins and they harden off quite red. So it's like a blackish, bluish green with red veins. Here's the even older leaf. The red is still on there. It has really nice fat lows that slightly overlap. This older leaf definitely has the overlapping lows. I just don't know if like for me, I need any more red chrysalinum. I think this is it for me. I do have another red chrysalinum that you guys haven't seen yet. Um, I'm gonna wait for a leaf to come out to show you, but I think I'm done collecting red chrysalinums, at least for the time being. If I had more room, that would be different. But since I'm like trying to save space, um, I think this is it. And I just feel eternally grateful that Amanda shared this one with me because I just love it so much. Okay, the final update I wanna show you I think I can bring this plant out. This plant I very rarely show anymore because it got so big that it's such a nuisance to bring it out of my tent. But this is Carla Wu One. This is the newest leaf on her. And ladies and gentlemen, she is making babies. This is I think the third or fourth flower on this plant. And the first one, I think I used the pollen on something. I don't remember. Oh, I think I used it on Carla Bivet, which didn't take. And the second inflow for sure, I didn't use a pollen on it because I got sick. And then like the info got moldy, so I didn't want to use moldy pollen on another plant. So this is the one that finally everything lined up. The berries have been developing rapidly. Like it hasn't been like, what did I put? I pollinated this on August 31st. So it's been a month and a bit. And I think that Carla, Carla and gestation period is like two and a half months, give or take. So this is going to be ready like, oh no. <laughs> there's a good chance these berries are going to be ready when I'm away. So this might have to go to Charmaine and she, she harvests these for me because this is going to be a really fun batch if it goes all the way to berries, which I'm really hoping it does. But this has been pollinated with Carla Bivet. So it's my Carla Bivet from Juan and Grant. I'll just pop the photo here because I'm too lazy to bring the plant down. But this is the pollen donor. So that one was um, Carla, the Juan Carla cross with round BVEP. I am hoping for, because since it's gonna be like three quarters Carla and like a quarter BVEP, I'm hoping for some specimens to inherit the Juan Carla veins, like those really jaggedy, minimal, like evil looking spidery Carla veins. I did see another, I, I don't remember who it was, but I did see on Anthurium Addicts, another person was selling seedlings of his, I think it was his Juan Grant Carla Bivep crossed with Carla 5x10. And a lot of them just look like straight up Carla. So I'm really excited about this cross. Like I don't think that any of the babies will be ugly unless they are runts. And I'm just like making sure that this thing gets fed and this thing gets watered. I do think that it is strong enough and mature enough to grow grow berries and it's about to push another leaf. So I just want it to stay strong and I'm really terrified that something's gonna go wrong, but so far so good. It's looking really good. This thing desperately needs a shower. There's like dead predatory mites all over it. There's dirt, there's dust. But I know that I saw like active predatory mites on here the other day. So I don't want to wash anything off. But in like about a month or so, I think I'm going to give this thing a nice shower and like a nice spa day. Okay, so before we start repotting, I'm going to go through like my travel process with plants. So I'm going to show you my IAS plants later when we repot them. But in total, I brought back 
seven plants and I'll just try to tell you everything I know but I'm not like a border agent I don't know every single law but I think I followed every rule and the only plants I brought back were anthurium so I can't tell you what's prohibited what's not prohibited what's like kind of on in the gray area in my mind the rule is like if if like plants in that family can survive up here it can be um rejected but things like philodendron anthurium hoya like those things cannot survive our winters in Canada. So they're generally allowed. One kind of unofficial way to check and just kind of verify what you're doing is allowed is going on the um, errors, errors system. So it's the automate, automated import reference system with CFIA and this is specifically for Canada. So you just answer a whole bunch of questions like yes, no, from a drop down menu, what kind of plants you're bringing back and it'll tell you whether it's allowed or not. That's not like the definitive yes or no it's not allowed it's like a general kind of guide it's just a reference system so you can't be like this said it can <laughs> so this is the authority like the border is going to be the authority so in general you're allowed to bring um 50 plants up with you up to 50 plants not over if it's on your person you do not need a phytosanitary certificate from the u.s if you are shipping it though you will need a phytosanitary certificate from the issuer it has to be grown in the u.s originating from the u.s and i think they need to have been growing it there for a year i don't know how they will even like verify this like if a seller imported something and sold it three months later and shipped it to you how are they going to know that i i don't know how they do that it should be soil free which for the most part if we're dealing with house plants they're pretty much none of them are in soil like even if it's like a peat um, base they don't consider that soil so as long as it's not like a plant that was like growing in the ground in florida and then you just like picked it up and then brought it back with you to canada but if you're worried about border agents like questioning that and like confiscating it based on the fact that it looks like soil just put it like just bring some sphagnum moss or something with you wrap it in paper towel something to bare root the plant and then bring it back with you if you want to avoid those questions so what i did is i brought a big hunk of sphagnum moss with me in order to like bare root everything and then wrap all the root balls in sphagnum moss just to avoid those questions but in the end we just didn't bother we just like wrapped the pot the whole pot we basically wrapped them as if we were shipping them so we taped down the pot with some polyfill and tape so it doesn't fall out and then we polyfilled the leaves and then we wrapped the whole plant with the leaves facing up in this like cellophane kind of sleeve I got these sleeves off Amazon and we use this when we ship plants for our live sales but I everything that I brought back from my IS I, I just kept them because they were fine they didn't rip or anything and I taped them nice and snug they're nice and padded and then I put them in a paper bag which was my carry-on or I guess it's my, my personal item so I carried it on with me so it would be on my person when I went through customs so I wouldn't have to wait for my suitcase to like open it up and show them I wanted to be able to show them at the um, customs desk and with the exception of like two leaves everything came in pretty well there was one emergent leaf that had the tip broken off which is honestly fine and one leaf got a little bit like kind of rotty like it looked like it was just sitting too wet for a little bit too long and it just got a little bit damaged but other than that everything came in great so again like if you're bringing plants from the U.S. to Canada I would strongly recommend going on the CFIA website and checking with errors to make sure it's okay screenshot these pages that are relevant to you and bring it with you just in case they have questions i was really lucky because the border agent was like so you you state that you have plants what are they i was like they're right here um they asked me like what kind of plants they are i said they're all anthurium um they're house plants um they're not they're grown in pots in a soilless substrate and she asked to kind of see them so i just kind of pulled them out it was kind of still wrapped up she didn't ask me to unwrap it but they have the right to you want to make sure you have all the answers to all the questions they might have because you don't want them questioning you and then like potentially scheduling a secondary inspection at your house or making i don't know holding the plant and inspecting it or god forbid like destroying the plant and then in terms of tsa when i was like getting through security with the plants it was in again like a paper bag it was taped shut so they wouldn't be fall flying everywhere it was pretty snug so they weren't moving around a lot i did get called to the side um at, at security and they were like what the hell is this because i was looking at the screen it just looked like a bunch of cotton candies like because it was all the polyfill and it would just look like a cotton candy with a little little cone shaped pot and I was like their house plants and I like open it up and you can see like the edges of some leaves poking out so they were just like yeah that's fine there's going to be no issue with security so if you're leaving from US they don't care that you're leaving with the plants it's when you're entering a country with the plants that's when they care 
actually in saying that, like if you're leaving Hawaii or leaving New Zealand with plants, that might be a different story. So this is just leaving like continental US to Canada. So I actually didn't unpack those plants for like two or three days after I got back from Miami because I knew I needed to film the process and like film what it looked like, the packaging and everything. So I was just like catching up on stuff. So it took a couple of days. I think that's why maybe that one leaf melted. And I did definitely want to quarantine them for a little bit. That's why they're in the bin. Um, and not to mention, I don't really have room for them anywhere else at the moment, but um, I'd wanted to make sure they were quarantined because they came from IS. They're just in contact with so many plants. So yeah, everything is good right now. There's just sitting here um, under the soul tech light is above it. So it's not like, a lot of light but it's good enough light the plants the leaves have been growing okay so we're gonna clot these up this is literally the bin that i've had them in they fit in here perfectly i had the lid slightly ajar like that just so it wasn't used to like 100 percent humidity because i'm not sure where i'm gonna grow these yet i didn't want them to be like so delicate that it would start throwing a fit once they were out of the bin. So I've kept them like this just so there's some airflow. So if you watched my vlogs, um, I did show them to you at the end of each vlog. They were kind of like separated by one video. So I'll show them to you all once again. This thing is so pretty. So this one is the open pollinated Carla from Fairchild. I did talk to Christy. Christy, I think is the horticulturalist for Fairchild and she did the live um, on Palm Street. But I think she said, because when I met with her at IES, she said like they sell on eBay and stuff. And I asked her if she was gonna do more Palm Street lives because like she seemed really camera shy. And I know like if you're not used to being on camera, it can be, especially if you're alone on Palm Street, cause she was doing that whole thing alone. It can be really daunting and like really nerve wracking. And she said that she was gonna do more Palm Street Live. So I'm really excited because her Palm Street Live was very different from other ones because like she works at Fairchild, right? Like they have these like generations old plants and she was selling stuff that you just don't see elsewhere it's not just anthurium she was selling like cool ferns and things like that um, you can see a lot of the stem is above the substrate so i'm gonna get that into a taller pot the pot options i'm going for today i'm pretty sure are gonna be one of these two and this is the plant where the leaf tip got ripped off in transit this was literally just like a emergent rolled up taquito leaf when it was wrapped up so all things considered it wasn't the worst i really have no idea what this could have been crossed with I'm going to guess something with silver veins because the veins on this, I don't know if the camera is going to catch it, but the silvery veins are quite sparkly and a lot more sparkly than I find Carla veins to be. Like I find Carla veins to be kind of silvery and kind of like metallic, but they don't sparkle with this like brilliant sparkle the way that crystallinum does. So I'm going to guess it's kind of something in the crystallinum -y kind of direction is what it was pollinated with. Not to mention um, the leaf texture is really thick. Like usually I feel like the leaves don't really get this thick until the plant is a bit more mature and the leaves are larger than this. But usually at this age, it doesn't really feel this thick. This is the Fairchild Crystallinum um, or FTG Crystal as it's called. It has pushed one new leaf. I don't know if you can see it. This one's gonna go in probably the smaller of the square pods. I feel like this plant is the one that everyone went nuts for because it was such a great deal at IES and I'm kind of regretting only getting one, but I didn't want to like clear a whole tray of it. I'm spilling soil everywhere. This is the plant I got from Hunter. This is the two in one. I don't think I'm going to separate them yet, but the newest leaves have expanded quite a bit. This is the bigger of the two new leaves. They got slightly damaged there's a little bit more damage on the top of this leaf but the baby pink veins are still there i do feel like being in transit maybe stunted the expansion of the leaf slightly because you can see how tall these petioles are i'm not sure if these leaves are going to expand much more than this sorry i forgot to tell you the id this one is tim anderson longley crops of stripy mag f2 I'll show you my Paul plan. So this one is Carla Yard crossed with Stripey Meg. This is the one where it maybe got a little bit too wet. Maybe there was like moisture sitting on this leaf and it looked a little bit mushy, but it's kind of hardened off brown. I don't think that damage is gonna spread much. This one is in like a zeolite maybe tree ferny mix, which I'm going to keep. So I'm probably gonna like mix more of my soil in with this one. These ones are the ones that actually need to repot because 
in tiny little pots. I can see a lot of roots in here. So this one is Carla Kuna crossed with Stripey X2. I just love his Stripey X2. It's so beautiful. This one, I am definitely excited for it to grow out. With Carla Kuna, it's so fat and so spidery. And then the Stripey X2 is so fat and spidery. And then, oh, this one I watered. This one is Pap AF, which is possibly a Regale Napo hybrid, crossed with Carla PM6, which looks very heavy on the Carla. And I was saying in the vlog that he showed me photos of his holdbacks, and they're slightly bigger than this, but it has all these like spidery Carla veins, and they're like super skinny and super long. And it popped a new leaf since coming home and that's looking really daggery. There is just so much zeolite in here. It looks like zeolite, lava rock, maybe some pumice. These ones have tree fern. This one doesn't look to have tree fern. So this looks like some sort of homemade pond mix. And then last but not least, my Carla from Phil at Stelmar Gardens via Homebody. This thing is so pretty, you guys. I'm so excited to have it. So I was talking to Phil and I did have to cut a lot of this out of the video because I was told that Phil was like very private. You basically never hear about him. He sells his stuff, but he often will sell through other people. So he sells a lot of his plants and his like Tim Anderson plants through um, the Homebody. And he has a lot of Tim Anderson plants that he breeds with. So this is a Carla. Rory's original wild clone of Carla crossed with a different Carla from um, Rory and when I met him he was talking about these Carlas and he was saying how these for him he found that they grew best in net pots like this but personally I don't like net pots just because like the roots escape and it's just a lot of root breakage whenever you repot them and I do like to repot pretty often for my anthurium and I don't doubt that they do better for him but I can't assume that whatever works for him, I can just copy and paste it and it'll work perfectly in my conditions. It has not pushed a leaf yet, but it's looking pretty swollen. So maybe in like a couple weeks, a new leaf will emerge. This one might be my favorite acquisition of all of IAS. And I got that before I even went to IAS. Like I got it on Palm Street maybe a week before IAS. And I thought I was going to come home with another Carla other than that one, but I didn't. And then um, everything is going to go into my tree fern soil mix. Like the usual like on the bottom tree fern soil. I think I'm going to go headless so you guys can actually see the plants. As usual, we're on my perlite bin. You know, I need to like upgrade some of the stuff in this room. Like getting a proper surface to film repots on, but one thing at a time. The first, the next thing I want to get is a shelf for my seedlings. So I want to get a taller shelf that I can put like racks and racks of seedlings because these seedlings, they're coming and have nowhere to grow them. Okay, let's talk about IS while I put these things up. I'm gonna start with the little tiny Paul plants because they're really easy. By the way, I'm going to be dumping all the substrate into here so that I can actually reuse it. Oh, this one is just straight up tree fern. Okay, that's good. It's not heavily rooted, which is actually kind of okay for me because it'll fit into that pot for longer. Okay, so IAS recap. As you guys know, that was my first time at IAS. I'm just mixing my tree fern soil into this bowl, by the way, since there's tree fern in here already. So we had only a few days in Miami. Um, we arrived on Friday evening and then the show was on Saturday, Sunday and we left Monday. But on Friday, our flight um, left Vancouver at 6.30 a.m. I think it was. So I was awake at like 2.30 a.m. to like get ready and finish packing and then um, get to the airport. So I only had like maybe three hours of sleep that night. And then we landed and I was like, honestly, not going to do anything. We were just gonna get food. I wasn't sure what was going on. I was honestly banking on getting like a full night's rest and then going to IS the next day. But then um, I was at dinner and I was messaging Jeff at Palm Street. He was like, come to Perfect Choice. So we went there and then we were only going to stay for like an hour. But then it ended up being like pretty late by the time we got back. And so the following day, we were again very tired because we had to get up early again, get breakfast, and then go to the expo by eight o'clock. But we were at breakfast by seven. But I feel like Friday was the beginning of the craziness. 
So Perfect Choice Nursery was like about 30 minutes away from the expo. And it was like this kind of kickoff party for IAS and like people were mingling and they were doing like giveaways and stuff like that. And when I went there, I was really only gonna just like meet with like some of the Palm Street people, look at some plants. Like I thought it was gonna be really low key. I did not expect how many people would know, like recognize and want to talk to me. That was probably the first initial shock of IAS. So Palm Street did sponsor like a small group of creators and you would have seen them in my vlogs. And of everybody there, I had the smallest audience. So I really kind of felt like already going into it, I was already feeling some sort of like imposter syndrome, like what did I do to deserve this opportunity? And then when I got there and I'm like, oh, okay, so Sean's here, Sean, like everybody knows Sean, right? Like I've been watching his videos, I've known of him for years, like he's just been around for so long, like how are we in the same group of people? And also knowing like, the types of people who would be at IAS, like the big sellers and legends like Bill, Enid, et cetera, et cetera. Like there's just way cooler people to talk to. So I really wasn't expecting to say hi to so many people and like so many people wanting to chat and like saying just the nicest things to me at the Perfect Choice event. I wanna say that like, I am so, so fortunate that the people watching this video and commenting on a weekly basis are so positive and so nice. But when you're standing in front of somebody, like a face-to-face -face saying that to you, oh my gosh, my fingers. When you're standing in front of somebody and they're saying that to your face and you can actually like read their expression and they're able to put into words in a different way, than you would into text. It was a whole bunch of random stuff. It was like, you know, I keep you company or like, thank you for talking about Coco Coir because that was the, the issue with my, my plants. I was not expecting that in the slightest. Part of that is because um, it was a bit of culture shock, to be honest. If you've ever been to Vancouver or if you're a Canadian, you might know like Vancouver people, which I don't like where this tag is, Vancouver people have this reputation of being very standoffish. Like you don't really talk to people. Vancouver people kind of pretend like you're not there all the time. I personally don't see myself as standoffish, but it is very normal for me for people to be standoffish. Oh my gosh. This is so much zeal. Like, wow, precious. Look at how blue this substrate is. Okay, so this, is growing in one of those like horticultural sponges. And I'm told there is a seam that you can rip it like this, like this. I think it's like this. Maybe there's a better way, but this seems to be working. Hold on, I need all my brain cells to concentrate on this. This sponge is really quite soft, so um, I'm not breaking any roots so far but I might break some of the finer ones. Not sure yet. Mm, so far so good. If there's a little spongy pieces left over, I'm not gonna fuss too much with it because I know this will break down, I think. I only learned this from the Woohoo Lives because they were growing in this for a little bit, but they decided to like not continue growing stuff in sponges. But this seems really easy to break. It's kind of like, um, like a mochi sponge cake and you're free. There's like a little bit left, but I'm not gonna worry about that. But anyway, that's kind of part of why uh, this should fit, yeah. That's part of why the Friday night ended up being a lot later of an evening than I was expecting. I was trying to like film a little bit um, and say hi to certain people that I knew was there because I knew Fabiana from Homebody was there. And I'm literally like Jeff, Jeff from Home Street was trying to take me around to meet people. And he was like, I think I saw Fabi walk this way. And he would try to take me from one end of the room to the other, but we just kept getting stopped in between. And he thought it was freaking hilarious. And he was like, can't take you anywhere. But when I say I'm shocked, I'm like, I'm not joking. I was not expecting that. Like the size of my channel is very small, you know, and I'm not based in the US. It's not like I'm constantly interacting with people in groups and you know, they know who I am. I'm not a seller. So, to have that kind of welcome to Miami was was mind boggling. So like Friday night was like, wow, that was, that was crazy. I was not expecting that. 
Um, but then going into IS day one at the expo, I was like, okay, well, yesterday was, you know, yesterday. It was a party. We, people were there to socialize. Like that was the whole point of the event. So IS day one, like we're in the same rooms as these like legendary plant people. There's no way like that's going to happen again. But it actually ended up happening even more on IS day one. And I was operating on very little sleep. So it was a lot to process. Um, I am so grateful to everyone who came and said hi. I would not have changed a thing except for I do worry when I think about it. Like when I look back and I was like, I was so tired. Did I look tired? Did I look like, you know, not all there? I have no idea how I was coming across to people. So if there's one thing I would change is possibly that, but I don't even know how I was coming across to people who were coming to say hi. To be fully honest, it was very stressful. Um, I was coming back to talk to Charmaine about it. Before IAS, I didn't want to talk to her about IAS because I know she was like really upset to not being able to be there. But after I'm like, I was able to give her a fuller picture of what like the reality of IAS was like, like the highs and the lows um, so that we can collectively both prepare for next year because there's no way she's missing it next year. So I really want us to go together next year. And I was talking about like how it was so surreal to be recognized in public like with the size of a following I have and I feel like my videos are very very niche it's never been a priority for me to reach as many people as possible or to grow this channel as big as possible as quick as possible I've always tried to keep it very intimate here um, but I was saying to her that it was really stressful because um, I was putting a lot of pressure on myself to create the best possible video because this video was sponsored and I do not want them to feel like any sort of regret in sponsoring me like just knowing what other creators they could have sponsored. So the filming aspect was really stressful because I wanted to do as good of a job as possible but stopping what I was doing every five minutes to talk and then kind of losing my train of thought was making me nervous that I wasn't really sure what I was capturing because I was like what did I just capture? What did I just film? What was I talking about? Was it interesting or not? Like my brain was going um, like a million different places at once. By the way, I would not have changed anything about like people saying hi. That was honestly the most beautiful thing ever. I just wanted Charmaine to know that what happened because had I expected that level of um, interactions with people, that wouldn't have been nearly as stressful. It probably wouldn't have been stressful at all. Like if you had been very aware of what it was going to be like. Um, the trouble is I was not aware at all. I think if you've watched enough of my videos, you'll know that like, I'm not a very social person and I'm, I don't really have a lot of friends. So to be around so many people that wanted to be my friend, it was a very novel feeling for me. <laughs> okay, so this one has like a bigger root system and I'm wondering if I should boat mode it. I think I want to boat mode it. I don't know why I just suddenly had that urge, but I'm going to boat mode this one. So this one's going to go into the four inch pot. The other big takeaway for me is that next year, I am 100% going earlier than I did this, this year. So if you're planning to go next year for the first time, my recommendation would be to like show up on the Wednesday, Thursday at the latest, um, and then IS will be Saturday, Sunday. Show up early, get some rest, go and see something in Miami, at least get one full night's rest. That would make a night and day difference to your experience. I think if there's one regret I had is um, that I wasn't able to like kind of get to see the, in more nursery. So I only went to see Fairchild, but I wish I would have been able to see like Silver Chrome. If I was able to visit Paul's nursery, that would have been amazing. So that's definitely something I would, would, would change for next year. I am not a kind of party kind of person, so I don't think that I would need to be like downtown Miami in South Beach or anything. That's not really what interests me. I would rather go to the nurseries and do stuff like that. But I would have maybe um, planned a couple more like food visits um, and get some more Cuban food. We did have Cuban sandwiches, but it was a very quick little lunch. I wish I had a like, nice sit down Cuban dinner. That would have been nice. In terms of plants, um, do I have any regrets on things I didn't pick up? I think it would have been really nice to get one of Rory's cycads, but I wasn't 100% sure if it was allowed. 
and I didn't want to take any risks on it. So I left it there, but hundred percent, if he's selling again next year, I'd be trying to get a side cat or at least I'd be like verifying that they're allowed back into Canada. I'm just going to pop a little footage here of one of the side cats that I absolutely adored from Rory. It was so beautiful. It was this like dusty kind of bluish, grayish, light green. It was very succulent in feeling. It had this like curvy growth pattern. It was so beautiful. I don't think I could have afforded it. Maybe next year I could, but I didn't have the funds for that one. <laughs> when I was editing the video, I was like, why didn't I get one of those Michelles from Rare Plant Fairy? But then like now after I just like talked about my NSC Red Crystal, I'm like, maybe I didn't need one. <laughs> I have, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, five Red Crystals of varying levels of red. I don't think I need more. <laughs> if anything, I need less red crystals. I'm just shoving the plants I'm done with over to the side, by the way, and I'll inoculate everything with great white after. Let us do the FTG crystal. I am wondering, do I want to keep this substrate? Let's pour it out and see. Oh, wow, it's very gritty. It's like almost all rocks. It looks like a lot of charcoal, some bark, perlite, but a lot of charcoal. There's also little slow release fertilizer pellets that are like little pink ones and little yellow ones. I'm undecided, so I'm going to pop this into a separate little container and we can decide to use it or not. I didn't realize how late it was getting and um, I still need to go to Costco today. Another small regret I had was not getting one of these for Charmaine. And one of the reasons why I didn't is because like she and I have never expressed interest in this plant before. So I know that if she was there, she might have been a little bit caught up as I was with like the FOMO. Like everyone was freaking out about these and like might as well get one because they're pretty affordable. And she would have gotten one, but um, would she buy one off of like a purge or a website or a palm street i don't know if she would and also after getting off facetime with her i was like literally how many plants are you coming back with and they're not all hers but i'm thinking she's coming back from california with like 30 or 40 plants but if she didn't have to spend that 60 dollars, i'm sure she's fine <laughs> fine with that and once this grows out if she likes it i can always cut it for her so really i only came back with seven plants which is not it's for me that's quite a lot I know people are coming back with way more plants than that. I am, I have no regrets um, on the plants that I came back with or what I had missed out on. There will always be more. And next year I will definitely be budgeting um, prior to Miami and being very clear on what I'm able to spend ahead of time. And I'll just have a way better angle on like how the day might be going, preparing myself mentally for the chaos. It's really hard to pinpoint what about it was a lot like whether you were a spectator or vendor um, a speaker or whatever it must be just being in the room with like a few hundred people uh, and a lot of plants and a lot of emotions some of you guys know that i'm a really big fan of samantha ravendahl she's like a beauty beauty youtuber i mean she has like a million subscribers so i'm sure some of you watching this will be subscribed to her she's just like the most the smartest like most well-spoken super thoughtful artistically very skilled YouTuber I've ever seen. She recently put out a video. So as a, at the time of uploading this video, it would have been her most recent video. Um, she was just kind of talking about like, I don't know how to show up online anymore. Meaning like, I don't know what people want from me. I don't know like what even to do on the internet. YouTube has evolved so much in the time that she's been on YouTube. In looking at this, by the way, I think I could very easily separate these like there's roots on both of them I could just do this it's giving me a little bit more resistance than I would oh there we go anyway so she was saying like um just the way that creators are making videos now like that's not how she's accustomed to making videos and um the way that you're supposed to show up to videos like always perfect and like really happy and um you want to be the best version of yourself online and like there's no Nothing against people who do that because you have your boundaries and you don't want to show every part of your life. But she personally liked to show all the bad stuff, 
along with the good stuff. Um, but if she was restricted to only showing the bad stuff and not talking about her struggles and stuff, she would not enjoy YouTube. And um, it's like the human connection that she finds the most gratification from. And the one thing that she said that like, kind of like, I didn't realize that this is something that always kind of is on my mind and I'm sure is on every person's mind that is on YouTube is that like you basically you you project a version of yourself right or like bits and pieces of yourself in your videos and you reveal parts about your life and you reveal parts about your personality in your videos and ideally those things that you reveal are honest and true to what you really are and what you really believe in and your um, what's important to you but then in terms of like what you don't reveal on um, online, the viewer then fills in the gaps for what they think you are all about and what you stand for and what's important to you and stuff. It makes you wonder if what you are putting down, people are actually picking it up or are they kind of twisting it into a different version of you? And there's literally nothing you can do about it. So it's not really worth spending too much time thinking about it, but this one's going to go in a bigger pot by the way because it has a bigger root system you can't help but wonder these things like am i being perceived the way i hope to be perceived like when you watch back your videos when you're editing and stuff i did this like one repot and chat like a few weeks ago talking about my experience on youtube and how i don't really know what i'm doing with social media and i don't really have a strategy in like how i try to optimize my content and like reach as many people as possible and there's definitely a part of me that doesn't want to reach that many people because i prefer for this channel to be at a very um, manageable size where i feel like i know the people that are watching i feel like i know the people that are commenting i feel like the people that are watching um, kind of know a bit about me so i don't have to explain everything all the time it feels more safe this way for me it feels like a nice comfy cozy space right now so what i'm trying to say is that like the interactions i had at is it was like, overwhelming for me because i'm trying to find the right words to explain i i honestly feel like i'm just raw dogging youtube and so the fact that people would come up to me and say these like really thoughtful and like um, just meaningful things, not just like, hey, I know who you are, you know, like it was actually like saying real things to me. And it made me so grateful that I, I guess I went the route of staying very small and intimate and not trying to grow it as much as I could. Not that I could definitely grow it really big if I wanted to, if I tried, but I'm grateful for the size that I am and that the kind of videos where people, maybe they're not watching, maybe they're um, just playing in the background, but it showed that people were listening. Um, and I feel like, oh, there's a sticker on here. This one says Dark Phoenix Self. Uh, I'll grab a different one. It feels really special knowing the fact that you might be a part of someone's like chores, like you're, you're doing laundry or they're cooking or they're painting or something like, you're actually a part of their home life. That seems like such a sacred and precious place to be. And so this is kind of stuff that I don't think about on a daily basis. There's a little hitchhiker in here. This is not the kind of stuff that I'm like dwelling on and kind of ruminating on all the time. This is just like me coming out of IS feeling really overwhelmed and like, okay, let's, let's just stop and think about it for a second. Like, why am I feeling this way? I just realized my camera was not charging this whole time and it's gonna run out of battery. So that's kind of like where my brain landed um, after having two weeks of trying to process what what IS was and um, how to prepare for it better next year and just like feeling a lot of, love, a lot of feelings. So enough about that. I wanted to talk about the IS member dinner um, and the panel. So the panel didn't, there wasn't that many questions. So you had the opportunity or like members had the opportunity to submit questions to them ahead of time. And then they would choose a few to talk through during dinner. Um, I honestly don't think they answered that many questions. So I tried to jot down like a note or two for each each person. So one thing, I think I knew this about Doc Block, but I didn't know this about Marie Nock. By the way, Marie Nock was the owner of Re Gardens, but um, recently kind of shut her operation down and she sold her basically her whole her whole stock, I guess you would call it. Um, I'm sure she still has plants, but she sold a lot of her, her mother plants to uh, Harry, who is Plant Zaddy Therapy. So Marie and Doc Block don't grow any plants 
indoors. Zero. I don't know if that's like a common thing in Florida, but that that was like, that stuck out to me. Like, I guess it makes sense. But then like, wouldn't you want like something in your house, you know, as like decor, like a little tree, you know? Um, so I thought that was interesting. Also Marie and Steve, her late husband, um, were the creators of Delta Force, as most of you know, which is a hybrid of Clarinervium and Podato Podato radiatum. She said that in trying to breed that plant again, I don't know if it was um, breeding in the clary and podato radiatum again or like selfing um, delta force, but she has only ever bred two plants that was true to the original mother plant. So I thought that was very interesting as well. Enid was talking about philodendron that she's breeding. So she's got, uh, she's making a hybrid of Linamii crossed with variegated gloriosum which maybe would make something like a variegated pink glory kind of looking thing. So that, that might be interesting to some people. Um, she bred her variegated billete. I think she selfed it. I'm not really sure, but she's been uh, working on seeds for that for a really long time. There's some things that Paul is kind of focusing his breeding on. Um, he said that he's been focusing on um, the overall growth pattern on plants, not just like the leaf appearance. So he is focusing on the, the leaf to petiole ratio. So he doesn't want too small of a ratio where the petiole is like really short with like a lot of leaves. So if, with a bushy plant, it ends up looking as he called it a Roman shield. <laughs> like think about just like one big helmet with like all the, all the petioles in the middle. But he didn't want too large of a ratio where the petioles are so long and then you have a lot of negative space. So like he's trying to focus on breeding down or using as um, parent plants, plants that he likes the growth patterns on, trying to breed that on to future offspring, which I think is like kind of refreshing to hear. You know, it's just like someone thinking about the nuances of growth pattern because we often don't think about growth patterns until it becomes a nuisance, you know, like we don't really think about how annoying a plant is until it gets really large. I mean, I get, I run into that issue all the time with plants and that's kind of the reason why I get rid of a lot of plants once they reach maturity because I'm like, I can't, I just can't with you. So um, it's kind of nice to hear that someone's like kind of thinking about, you know, years down the line for their future buyers. And then Rory um, kind of touched on a subject I feel like a lot of people have been talking about lately, which is plant burnout, um, which wasn't really like the topic. The topic wasn't plant burnout. It was more talking about like advice you would give to people um, entering the hobby or, you know, just general advice on being in the hobby. And he just said like his best advice for growers is to not let your collection get out of control in terms of quantity, this is not a verbatim quote, by the way, um, because what once brought you so much joy um, as this hobby can be the thing that would actually detract from your overall happiness. So the net, the net is a negative um, and you don't want that with a hobby, obviously. It made me think like how fortunate we are um, to even have a hobby. Like it just, some people, search their whole lives for a hobby that sticks and like how how amazing is it that we found something that we actually like you know can not oh my gosh i keep grabbing this one pot with the sticker how fortunate are we that we have a hobby that we can stick to and um you know maybe sometimes you burn out from it but we always come back to plants right i mean not all of us <laughs> i've seen plenty of people exit this hobby but uh, you know what i'm saying like it's like it's not something to just, what's that saying? Not something to shake a stick at. I think every now and then it's worth kind of remembering that it's a privilege to have a hobby in the first place. Um, and it's a privilege to, it just, it's, it's all, it's all a privilege. <laughs> like house plants, it, they don't, it's not a basic human right. It, house plants aren't, um, you know, a, a basic necessity, but if you take plants away, our lives probably, we would miss them. Like that's one of the first things I miss when I leave like on vacation. I just like, I miss my plants. I want to see my plants. Like I pine for my plants, but I can definitely relate to the notion that like, if you get too many plants um, and you don't have a good way of editing down the collection of like either like a network that you can sell or, um, or give plants away to that um, it can get overwhelming really quickly. Like as collectors, most of us are collectors. I just picked this 
pot. Did I mean to plant it in this pot? Yeah, let's do it. A lot of us have that collecting urge, that collecting mentality. I certainly do. Like my boyfriend and I both have like that collecting mentality. When we like something, we just want to get more and more and more of it. Um, and so one of the biggest things um, I've been grateful to have learned over the years is like finding the outlets to let go of plants and also being able to let go of plants, like getting over that sentimental attachment to certain plants, um, especially if you like, you know, was paid a lot for it at one point, but it's not worth a lot anymore, or it represented some very like, I don't know, memorable part of your life. Or if you made that hybrid, it can be really difficult to let things go. But once you've done it a few times, you realize that like, you don't really think about that plant. Like if it was already on the chopping block, and you get rid of it, you probably won't think of it again. Whereas there are certain plants where you're like, absolutely not, there's that plant is with me for life. Like if you ask me to just get rid of my king of spades to make space and be like, what the hell are you talking about? I'm not doing that. But there are plants where I'm like, you know, I probably wouldn't miss if it was gone. And I can tell you from experience, I don't miss those plants once they're gone. But I just thought it was really interesting for someone who has like a greenhouse or a nursery or whatever, to be speaking about a collection getting out of control in those terms, you know? Because I feel like space is probably not as much of an issue for someone like Rory versus like someone like me growing in this, like it's basically a nursery size room. And then just another general observation, this was not really, well, it was kind of touched on at the dinner um, with the panel, but it was just like, when I looked around that room, I'll insert a little clip of me kind of panning the room, but you know, the attendees were, quite young. I don't know, maybe refreshing? Is it refreshing? It's nice to see younger generations coming in to kind of fill in the gaps of people who have passed on um, or no longer in the hobby or cannot attend these kinds of events. I did a long time ago read a comment. I don't remember which Facebook group it was. Maybe it was like one of the enthusiast groups. I think the person who wrote it was a botanist. But he was saying like, yeah, botanists, you know, we, we need botanists to research and we need them to go out in the wild and like um, identify things, understand plants and study them and all that, st all the stuff that botanists do. But equally, we need hobbyists and enthusiasts um, to inject enthusiasm in the hobby. And without hobbyists, um, plants aren't exciting. And without excitement, like, you know, excitement, and passion leads to like um, industry and funding and stuff. Um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna get my great white. I wonder if they're even gonna fit in this bin anymore. We'll see, but I will water them or inoculate them in here. I've got my great white water. Actually, let's move this out of the way. It is fuller in here now because the pots are bigger and I also divided one. But it should still fit okay. Great white everything. I'm being a little bit messy because just because I'm a messy person. Oh, and also if in case anyone was wondering, Rory does not say Antalachiae. And if you don't want to say Antalachiae, <laughs> which I always say Bivep, he, um, he also does not say Antalachiae, but also he doesn't say Bivep, he says B-V-E-P. But I like to say Bivep. This is not, like, this is the only, like, Bill didn't talk as much. He was more, like, facilitating questions because he's more, like, the host of the dinner. But one thing he did say was, like, people were asking, I think the question was, like, pros and cons of tissue culture. And he was, he's a big tissue culture guy, right? Like, he's done a lot of tissue culturing. Um, or I don't know if like he sent a lot of plants to tissue culture or something like that, but he said um, the disadvantage of TC is that cutting plants so many times can cause mutations um, because like when you have cells uh, replicating, duplicating <laughs> cells, when do I, I don't know if that's the word I'm thinking of, duplicating, like cells duplicating <laughs> when they're doing that so rapidly and they just like constantly getting cut then that's where mutations can occur so these mutations either alter the overall look of the plant in a positive or a negative way sometimes it just causes variation sometimes it causes 
like distortion and causes aberrant forms to come out. If you watched part one of my IS vlog, we were I was talking to the homebody and they had a soul reaper um, and it's like a beautiful soul reaper. So they had cut that plant and then the cutting came out mutated. Like it was even more bubbly and like ripply and it looked like um, like a crumpled linen crepey like silky um, leaf texture. It was like it's beautiful. Like it did a positive thing. It mutated in a nice way in my opinion. So imagine doing that on a large scale and cutting a plant like so many pieces and then cutting them all again. Like the amount of cell duplicating um, that has to happen and like things not copying over like genes not copying over in the right way um, can cause mutations and he said that it's not necessarily a bad thing with tissue culture but that could be a bad thing with tissue culture so anyway we got this um, bin of plants bin of plants uh, repotted I'm sad that there's a bin here again I worked so hard to clear this space and like there always ends up being a bin here and um, next week Charmaine will be back from California with even more plants. Um, I am terrified. I'm terrified. I'm looking at my tent right now. Let me show you what I'm looking at right here. This red crystal is getting so big. Here it's full. Here it's full. Here it's full. Here it's beyond full. These leaves are like getting smushed. They have nowhere to go. Um, up here is pretty full. I did clear space back there, but that's literally like the only space. My dark phoenix is, she's sad. Um, the inflow, by the way, if you guys want to update. Oh, actually, I pulled it off. We did pollinate this thing with uh, Gigi Port. Did not take, um, probably because she is really mad at me right now. This thing needs to be chopped up. I don't know if I'm going to do it in a video, but um, I'm going to chop it up. And what's holding me back is I don't know where these cuttings are going to go. Um, and then up there is like super full too, all the way across. So yeah, don't know where all these plants are going to go, but we'll figure it out. We always figure it out somehow. Anyway, this video ended up being much, much longer than I had anticipated. What time is it? It's 5.30. I need to get dinner on and we need to go to Costco. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope your weekend has been lovely. I love you so much and I'll see you in the next one. Mwah.